Unfortunately, in any colonized country, the country and people take very long time to come out of the colonized mindset. And therefore, in India, unfortunately, there was nothing Indian in our education system. I mean, when I studied psychology, I was horrified because all of our textbooks were either American or Europe-centric. You know, there was nothing Indian. And, and that was very sad because I'm a follower of the uh, mother you know, who came from France to India. And I have been reading the mother and Sri Arbindo from a very young age. And I thought, because Sri Arbindo said, life is yoga and yoga is psychology. So, you know, all the philosophy, which was a part of psychology, a psychology that was a part of philosophy, uh, is totally missing from the curriculum. And, and the same with economics, the same with political science, humanities. So that's where we realized that bringing back the Indian knowledge system, which is not India as a geopolitical boundary, but India as a civilization. And that ancient wisdom needs to be revived, uh, revisited, integrated wherever possible. One of the impact of colonization as a trauma that I've seen in India at least is that anything Indian does not hold value. It comes from the West or is stamped by the West. So if yoga gets stamped by the West, then we say, oh, wow, yoga is our legacy. But you're not ready to own your culture or civilization, right? And, and that trauma has impacted uh, people going through low self-esteem about who they are. And they have lost their voice. I mean, I'm here in New Zealand. And unfortunately, I'm seeing the same thing happen to Maori culture here. You know, the way uh, we know of or we talk of Maori culture, the values, the well-being that it can bring to the world and humanity, you do not really see that integrated in education, workplaces, or their way of living. So that then becomes colonization, becomes a intergenerational trauma. Because I'm carrying my ancestors in my blood, right? I'm carrying my ancestors in my genes. And whether I'm aware of it or no, I'm carrying that in my psyche as an imprint. And that imprint has to be brought to an awareness level to be able to address it. Therefore, there is awareness and then there has to be action. And the only action I realize for trauma is dissolve it. You know, it's not a cognitive thing. It's a very emotional and experiential thing. So I cannot talk about it in a cognitive way and say, okay, I'm free of my trauma. The trauma has to be dissolved, right? And therefore, a lot of transdisciplinary interconnections have to be made. So we look at ancient wisdom, we look at modern sciences, we bring them together and then we create practices, everyday life practices that help us become aware of our trauma and address them. In India, I realized that the ideal could be that India becomes the voice for humanity where you, know, you see the vibrancy of people practicing Ayurveda, practicing yoga, living there civilizational, cultural values, which is slowly happening. Post-pandemic, it, it is slowly happening. So let me let me bring back the, the ancient wisdom from Ayurveda and yoga. Ayurveda, <laughs> as they describe it as a, you know, a manual of life skill, it's not just a medicinal system. Right? It's Veda, knowledge of Ayu. Ayu is life. Ayurveda actually describes life and the, the beauty of Ayurveda is that it is for everyone, right? So it's not for Indian people. It's not for a people from certain region. But the sages talked about humanity at large. 
and they say that our life has purpose and meaningfulness and to achieve that there are paths right so the the path begins with dharma where dharma is a sanskrit word coming from the etymology dharayati iti dharma so anything that sustains you holds you together is dharma and i felt it's a beautiful way to look at our life it's only psychology has taken more than 200 years to reach positive psychology where martin seligman and others are talking about meaningfulness and here there are sages many many millennia ago who wrote about how life has to be meaningful for us to be healthy and happy and then they describe life as hita beneficial to self and others because they always saw life as a continuum you know we and the cosmos we and everyone else are interconnected and only when we are leading a life which is interconnected and integral can we be happy and happiness is uh, you know not the pursuit of happiness that we understand today in a modern language but it's all about the state of being so it is called sukha in sanskrit su again is auspicious ka is space so how do you create beautiful auspicious space where you live whether it's your body whether it is your mind whether it's the community whether it's the nation or whether it's the world you know so all the well being crises that we see today i realize that ayurveda beautifully connects the well being of the planet and well being of an individual it's a continuum and also i add one more science which is a science of aesthetics in india natya shastra i realized that uh, what yoga ayurveda and the science of aesthetic are talking about is being rediscovered and not just rediscovered it's being validated scientifically by some modern theorists and today a lot of scientists talk of neurotransmitters etc but they look at only the brain while what condense pot was able to connect was two places in our body one is the heart but not heart as an organ but heart as a heart chakra and the spinal cord and what in yoga is known as you know if you revisit our biology or anatomy from yogic perspective our physical body uh, that can be seen and studied or you know x-rayed is one reality but we are also energy sheets right so the we are still stuck into learning biology and anatomy from a newtonian or cartesian divide body and mind but what is mind people have still struggling to understand while in ayurveda the body mind continuum in yoga the body mind continuum and how does it make our anatomy is very beautifully described where we have seven chakras the major chakras then we have many minor chakras and i'm glad today chakra like mantra and dharma is quite a word in a western vocabulary as well you know there are a lot of western writers who have studied experienced and written about chakras these are what kandespert talks of them as nodal points of neurotransmit and the the new the neurotransmitters on those nodal points of chakras are either blocked or they are open so when they are blocked naturally the energy flow is restricted and therefore the energy or prana does not reach those organs which are connected with those nodal points and then she talks of heart chakra because she says that heart chakra is a place where the blockages of trauma can be felt or blockages of emotion she doesn't call them trauma she calls them emotions can be felt and we need to open it up and she talks of not just psychosomatic illness but i think she was the first one to talk of psychosomatic wellness she was one of those i think first eastern scientist to say that body and mind is a continuum 
not just body and mind as a continuum and heart and spinal cord have a very special role in our healing. But she also talked of the cosmos and us. And she talked of microcosm and macrocosm, which yoga and Ayurveda talk about. So when I go back to yoga and Ayurveda as ancient sciences, as I said, if we all are integrated, we all are connected, then my energy and the world's energy is somewhere merging together, right? And energy we all know cannot be created or destroyed. It needs to be transformed. So when we look at trauma, trauma is, a, is an energy block as I see it personally. And I'm sure we can do more research in this area. But if it's a blocked energy, then which chakra is it impacting? Is it impacting your security? Is it impacting your relationships? Is it about your power or victimhood? Is it about your heart experiencing gratitude? Or is it about your heart experiencing a closed xenophobic existence where you, you, you know, you switch on to a survivalistic mode. And we all know, and this is what scientifically people talk about trauma and response to trauma from medulla and amygdala as, you know, fight, flight or freeze. But that fight, flight, freeze is not just brain limited. It, it travels all over the body. So when I'm fighting it's not just my brain which is fighting. All the cells in my body get into a fighting mode. And that's only a survival coping mechanism. So because it happens at a subconscious and unconscious level, right? And Kandat Spurt's work actually talks of what is mind. And she was one of the first person to say that mind is in every cell of your body, which is what yoga and Ayurveda also has been saying. So if my mind is in every cell of my body, then my trauma response is also coming from every cell in my body. Right? So it's not a cognitive skill. Now, this is where yoga and Ayurveda come into play because they have a lot of practices which can, one, help you dissolve these traumatic emotional imprints without wanting to bring them up to the brain, which is not able to cope. And they can be dissolved with a lot of Ayurvedic treatments, Ayurvedic lifestyle guidance, meditations, and yogic lifestyle. When I say yoga, it's not just exercise or breathing exercise or physical postures, right? Because yoga, Patanjali Yoga Sutra, one of the oldest texts of, you know, collation of yoga sutras, talks of yama and niyama, which are the behavioral codes at individual level and collective level. Talking about rituals, in India, we always, you know, all the prayers ended with saying, Shanti hi, Shanti hi, Shanti hi. Shanti means peace. Right? And in India, every mantra also or the prayer begins with chanting Om. If I Say aloud, Om. Om is creating a vibration within me and outside. And also, why do all play prayers end with saying peace, peace, peace three times? Right? Just one time could have been enough. And then I read a very small booklet which says that the three P's is invoking peace at three levels. One, individual, my, myself. Two, collective, which is community around me, society, nature around me, my nation. And three is at global level and universal level. So now when today there are wars happening, right? When there is so much destruction happening, where there is so much human suffering, I realize that working on peace and giving it a priority is very important. So when I started my research, I realized that unfortunately, most of the Western researches define peace 
as absence of war or conflict. Peace is not seen as a positive construct in itself, which is there in India. In Indian literature, in Indian philosophy, peace is a positive construct. Health is a positive construct. Health is not as opposed to disease. And peace is not opposed to war or conflict. So if peace is a construct in itself, how do you arrive at it? How do you actually start experiencing peace within? And chanting mantras, chanting simple, uh, I realized was one way. Then I was reading the mother, right? And the mother says very clearly that peace has to be invited. Peace exists around us at a vibrational energy level. But we have to become calm enough to invite peace. And the moment we start inviting peace by saying Shanti, 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 or you can use a word in your language, your mother tongue, right? The moment you start experiencing that, giving that a priority, slowly your life begins. And connecting back to David R. Hawkins' work, which I've also mentioned in my this chapter, that peace is a, one of those highest vibration for an individual. And when we vibrate at a higher energy or frequency, it compensates for thousands of people around us. So let's say if we include this as a part of leadership training, that leader of the organization or leader of a team will be able to be compensating a lot of negative energy or negative emotions in the ecosystem. Let's say if we train teachers to vibrate, right? At this level, we'll be creating generations of students who will grow up more into the well-being zone rather than the disease zone, trauma zone. And if we naturally train our national leaders, international leaders, right, to be vibrating at a certain level, I'm sure the humanity will have a greater, much better future. We talk of ancient or indigenous wisdom at one, you know, one level, and then we say this is modern, right? And a lot of people have this misconception that ancient is outdated. And a lot of people think modern is more scientific, modern is the complete know-how. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we realize that what is ancient is being rediscovered by many modern theorists, right? So it's we as humanity, we just have to take a U-turn, go back to our own cultural roots, civilizational roots. And I realized that all, most of the indigenous cultures, because they were connected, rooted in nature. I've been to Hawaii, I've met some of the kahunas, the wisdom holders. And one of the lady, I still remember, she held my hands and she said, you are one of us. And I realized that she felt that and I felt that because of the mother earth, right? We could have lived in different lifetimes. We could have lived on different geographical locations. But ultimately, it's all ones. In all ancient indigenous cultures, I found one theme common is, apart from being connected with nature, they are also connected with their ancestors. You know, so ancestral healing. So our history, our ancestors are living within us not just genetically, but psychologically and spiritually. So ancestor healing is a major ritual in most of the indigenous cultures, including India. In India, we, we have birth charts, right? I mean, the moment you are born, depending on the time of the birth, they create a birth, child, uh, birth chart for every child. And most of the birth charts have a problem with ancestors. It's called Pitru Dosha. Pitru are ancestors and Dosha is some problem. Now, obviously, we really don't know what 
our ancestors were going through, right? Beyond a certain generation, we don't even know our ancestors. And we don't even know what their life was. We don't even know what trauma they went through. But whatever that trauma, we have inherited it. Also, whatever the trauma of Mother Earth, right? I mean, when we are saying climate change, climate refugee, what is happening to Mother Earth is impacting us. So that's also an ancestral trauma. And there are a lot of rituals, uh, rituals connected with the five elements. So the element of sky or ether or akash, the element of air or vayu, element of fire, element of water, and element of earth. Because many ancient indigenous cultures believe that the, the entire universe and our body all are made up of these five elements. And therefore, when we include, you know, fire rituals, water rituals, we build them as practices. I think industrial revolution uprooted people from nature. So nature become a resource to be used and exploited. People became resource that needs to be used and exploited. And we didn't realize that we ourselves became a resource which was exploited by others and we are exploiting others. And this trauma, I think, <clears throat> needs to be addressed because today corporates have to wake up, you know, to the, the spiritual aspect, which is not a philosophical aspect. But I would say spirituality is a basic foundation. And, and most of the United Nations sustainability development goals are far away from being met when we are spending so much money on sustainability goals, climate change, etc. What we don't realize is we just need to bring back that foundation of spirituality in everything we do. And the moment that foundation comes back, right, everything will fall in its place. Right now, the, the, we have lost the bigger picture. And we are all struggling with pieces of puzzles, right? And trying to fit them here and there. But spirituality is like a bigger picture. And without looking at that bigger picture, we are not able to fit in those pieces of puzzles.